We're back with the new CBS News poll. The drop in COVID cases has in turn improved America's views on our handling of the virus. But people are still struggling with trying to deal with the pandemic's impact. Joining us now is CBS News Elections and Surveys Director Anthony Salvanto. Good morning to you, Anthony. You know, the CDC director says uh, we're still not out of the clear. Is that how the public feels? Yeah, good morning, Margaret. Yeah, that sense that things are better, but not yet well. When you look at the emotions that people express toward COVID safety measures right now, there is still a lot of patience with them, but it is mixed. There is frustration. There is exhaustion. It is not just one thing in the public mind. It's reflective of the fact that we've been through all these ups and downs in the waves. Now, when you look at particular measures, mask requirements, there still is a majority that would favor them. But the thing you want to understand is, besides partisanship behind this, is the difference between the fully vaccinated, who are far more supportive. They've long been more concerned about the pandemic, long been more concerned about what to do, and they are more supportive than the remaining unvaccinated, who are more frustrated and who feel that these measures do not work, Margaret. And we saw some of that in our own focus group that we did with parents uh, and really uh, across the board, we heard regardless of political affiliation, they were all incredibly concerned about their children. Yeah, when we talked to parents in this poll, we found that so many said that their kids' mental and emotional health, their kids' educational development had gotten worse during the pandemic, sizable numbers there. So yes, parents are seeing those changes. And what to do about it though? When you see parents who still support mask mandates with a majority saying they still could be required, how do those two things mesh? Well, there are plenty of things that parents do, as any parent of young kids will tell you, that they think will protect their kids, even though it makes them feel frustrated and exhausted. And finally, Margaret, I would add this. When people look right now at the state of things in the country, the number who say things are going well is up from last month, but it's still not a high number. So a little bit better, but not yet well. Margaret? Anthony, how people feel impacts how they might vote. Thank you. We go now to Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey. He was the first of several blue state governors this week to announce plans to roll back statewide mask mandates in schools. Good morning to you, Governor. Good morning, Margaret. The CDC says we are not there yet. Uh, you say you're following the science. So what do you know that the CDC director does not? Yeah, I think uh, New Jersey's Scott Gottlieb hit this point very well. Our numbers are, are improving, and I would use the word dramatically. Uh, rate of transmission, positivity rate, hospitalizations, cases, in-school transmissions, all going in a dramatically good direction. Uh, the, the, the challenge is this, this spike, this, this variant has spiked straight up and it's now coming straight down. New Jersey, New York got hit early in this wave as we have in all of the waves. The fact of the matter is our experience is very different right now from the average American state's experience. So the CDC, which we have been adherent to from the get-go, uh, and we think they're doing a terrific job, they've just got a much more complex reality. Uh, the, the science and the data and the facts on the ground in New Jersey have allowed us to take this step. Well, the CDC still says you're at a high transmission level, but I, I want to ask you about in Virginia, the Republican governor uh, here, right nearby Washington, D.C., uh, is locked in court battles over his decision to pull back mask mandates. He made that call back in January. Did you fear similar political blowback? I mean, did you look at that example? Now, listen, I think they've done it with great respect. They've done that backwards. Um, they basically banned mandates and, and, and uh, then said to the district, sue us to get that overturned. We've done the exact opposite. In other words, we're lifting the mask mandate, by the way, on March 7th. So we right. gave ourselves a four week runway um, and then allowed districts or individuals as they so choose uh, to, to put local mandates or wear masks in place. But for those local districts, I mean, aren't you just kind of transferring a political problem down to a more local level? How do those school districts, how do those mayors, how do they make the call? What benchmarks are you specifically giving them on whether it's safe to advise 
lifting those masks or not? Yeah. We have got the virus, at least as we sit here, Margaret, and every time you think you've got to figure it out, it humbles you. It mm -hmm. takes a turn you don't expect. But as best we can tell right now, this thing is going uh, from pandemic to endemic, and we feel it is the responsible step to take to allow districts, if they so choose, based on their local health realities, working with their local health officers, uh, to, to make a decision on their own. My gut tells me, particularly as we get into warmer weather in the spring and assuming the virus continues to go in the right direction, you'll have the overwhelming amount of districts uh, following suit and lifting the mandate. Did you get any timeline from the White House, from the CDC at all on when they will give federal guidelines to do what you're doing? We have not, although we think that the Biden administration has done an outstanding job managing this. But again, they've got a much more complex reality. This isn't one of these earlier waves where the mm -hmm. curves went sort of sweeping over months up and sweeping over months down. This thing goes up like a rocket ship and then straight down. I'm sure it's only a matter of time until we see federal guidance. I want to ask you, you know, as a Democrat, your thoughts here um, going into these races. You just went through uh, an election yourself. Uh, former President Obama spoke this week to House Democrats and told them to take the wins you can get, and it doesn't help to whine about stuff you can't change. Do you feel like Democrats are in a defensive crouch going into these midterm races? I'm not sure, Margaret, defensive crouch, but I, I would say that we've probably focused a lot more on what we have not been able to get done, a lot more on process than we have on the historic things that we have got done as a party. I mean, the president and, and, and Congress have gotten a bipartisan infrastructure law that is historic. Uh, the American Rescue Plan money's historic, by the way, a lot of which have yet to be spent. I think we should celebrate, just to pick those two examples, uh, and, and, uh, and remind folks how, why they got done and who delivered the, the goods for them. But when it comes to political liabilities, one of the things we've seen in our polling is the lived experience of Americans, and they experience the economy through the prices they pay. Inflation at 7.5%. I mean, is this the biggest political liability for Democrats, or is that just not how you see things? I think it's a challenge for Democrats, for sure. Um, I, I think, uh, and I'll put myself in this category, early on, we talked a lot about whether this was transitory, how deep and, and, uh, and impactful it would be. The fact of the matter is it's real. It's here. My guess is it's here for the balance of this calendar year. Uh, we've done a lot in, in our state as it relates to affordability. So I think anything Democrats can do, uh, we, we've passed 14 uh, tax cuts for the middle class and working families and seniors in our first term. Steps like that, making health care more affordable, college more affordable, uh, property taxes uh, mm -hmm. more affordable. Anything we could do as a party, uh, I, I have to believe will resonate because inflation is real. Very quickly, uh, is there a risk from this trucker convoy in these protests? I know New Jersey is a logistics hub. Without question, we have one of the largest ports in the country and I'm knocking on wood with, with our folks have managed it brilliantly in the context of this pandemic, but that trucker uh, reality is a threat without question. All right, Governor, thank you very much for your time today. We will be right back. And we're back with Congressman Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, who is one of two Republican members on the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Good morning to you, Congressman. Good morning. Uh, I want to start on what is happening most immediately uh, between Russia and Ukraine. You have these massive Russian military exercises. How do you assess the Biden administration's handling uh, of this situation so far? Yeah, look, I'm on, I'm on Team America, Team Ukraine. Uh, there are some nuances I would have done different than the Biden administration, but I think now is the time to, to stand unified. And what I'd say is, uh, they have done a good job, particularly in bringing out intel early to try to defang any Russian narrative that could come with Ukraine. We, we know about 
uh, the discussion of a false flag attack. Well, now we've made it clear that Russia may do that. And, uh, and so I think a lot of that is good. One thing I will add, though, is we have to shut down Nord Stream 2 regardless of what happens in Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. because Ukraine is using energy as a weapon. And I think that's important to do. Russia is using energy as a weapon. Um, yes, that's what I mean. Th that's yeah, what you Russia. mean. Yeah. Um, on Russia, generally, you know, there had been for so long bipartisan support for standing up to Russia and standing up for democracies. But there is this interesting trend within the conservative movement right now. Um, you have more Trump-oriented parts of the party, like, like Senator Josh Hawley, who recently called on President Biden to rule out admitting Ukraine into NATO. You have similar senti sentiments elsewhere. What is happening here? I mean, how significant a portion of the Republican Party is moving in this direction? Well, I don't think it's a huge portion, but it's way too big and it's growing and it's a huge concern. I mean, what was this five years ago? It might be like somebody like Rand Paul that would say something or Dana Rohrbacher. Now there's a significant number of folks doing it with Tucker Carlson talking about, you know, how great Vladimir Putin is and how Ukraine is really actually part of Russia. Um, I think it's a couple things. Number one, it could be some naivety on foreign policy, not in Tucker's case. I think it's an affection for authoritarianism. And I think Vladimir Putin has done a decent job of engaging in culture battles, in culture war. And he is seen as the person defending, in essence, the culture of the past. And so it's very frightening. And by the way, you know, Ukraine is next, sure. What ha already one third of the country of Georgia is occupied by Russia. Nobody's going to stop them from going into the rest of that. Then you have the Baltics, you have the Balkans that they're interfering in. Uh, this is a frightening moment. And any Republican that has affection for Vladimir Putin has no understanding of what our party stands for or our country stands for. Uh, when it comes to what your party stands for, you are on that January 6th committee, as we mentioned. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, the president's attorney, former attorney, um, is apparently speaking to the committee in some form. Is he being cooperative at this point? Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, what I can tell you is he's been subpoenaed. Our expectation is he is going to cooperate because that's the law. That's the requirement. Same as if somebody's subpoenaed to court. Uh, there may be some changes and dates and moments here as you know, lawyers do their back and forth, but we fully expect that in accordance with the law, we'll hear from Rudy. But look, regardless of when we hear from Rudy or how long that interview is, we're getting a lot of information and we're looking forward to wrapping this up at some point when that is right, showing it to the American people, but not rushing it, not hurrying this. We want everybody to have the full story. That's what's important. I have a new son. I want to make sure that in five and 10 years when he's learning about this in history class, he gets the full answer and not some conspiracy garbage that we hear out there every day. Is the plan still to begin those public hearings in the spring? I think spring or summer in, in that time frame is the hope. Basically, we want to be able to, to take this information and present it to the American people, not just in a report, which is going to be yeah. essential, but in people, in faces and in stories. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said this week in very clear terms that January 6th was a violent insurrection for the purpose of trying to prevent the peaceful transfer of power after a legitimately certified election. So unlike some Republicans, he's clearly pointing to the intent of the actors. He's not just talking about the fact that there was some violence. He's saying what the people were doing that day was inherently wrong. And what President Trump was saying about the election has also now been clearly said by Vice President Mike Pence to have been wrong. Does this give more political cover to Republicans running for election in 2022 to say this or is it still too dangerous? Well, it does give more political cover. The question is, will it? You know, I have, I have lost faith in some of the courage of my colleagues. I thought that every person, when they swore an oath, had some version of a red line they would never cross. Uh, but certainly Mitch McConnell's statement was important. Certainly the vice president's statement was important. But Margaret, this is a moment where every Republican, I don't care if you're running for city council all the way up to Congress, Senate, et cetera, 
every Republican has to be clear and forceful on the record. Do they think January 6th was legitimate political discourse? Don't let them avoid it. Don't let them hem haw and don't let them transition to some other subject they'd rather talk about. This is an answer every one of them have to give and then we can move on once they're clear and on the record. But this is definitive to our democracy. How do you feel? Was well, it legitimate? As you know, the chairwoman of the Republican National Committee um, and even Senator Marco Rubio, who was on this program last Sunday, argued that there's a difference between the day and then what the committee you were on and the work you were doing, what, what those things add up to. Um, they argue that your committee is persecuting ordinary citizens that had nothing to do with violence. How do you respond to that? I mean, it's obviously a convenient way for them to deflect. Uh, we are not looking at the 20,000 or so people that were there on January 6th that did not enter the Capitol grounds. We're looking at the corruption that led up to the moment and what happened since. We're talking about anybody communicating and of course those that went into the Capitol attempting to overthrow this. And they know that. Marco Rubio knows that. Uh, Ronna McDaniel knows that. All these folks know it, but they're trying to kind of parse around it because they don't want to tick off the base, okay? But they also don't want to appear, appear to be too in, in, in in there with Donald Trump, and that's the game. But the truth is, this is a moment where we have to choose. We have to take definitive lines, and it's starting to shape up. It's starting to happen, but everybody should have to take a position. Congressman, thank you for your time today. We'll be back in a moment. Inflation went up again in January, and there is growing pressure on the Federal Reserve to increase interest rates in order to cool down the economy. Mary Daly is president and CEO of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank. Good morning to you. Good morning. You know, we say consumer prices are at the highest level in 40 years. I mean, if you look at certain items like car prices, they're up more than 40 percent compared to where they were last year. Energy's up 27 percent. Bacon <laughs> up 18 percent. I mean, you've said inflation is going to get worse before it gets better. What do consumers need to be bracing for and what needs to be done to get this under control? So first, it is very true that inflation is too high and is really hitting the pocketbooks of average Americans across a wide range of categories. The Federal Reserve is actively focused on this. As you know, we've talked about changing our policy stance, raising rates as early as March, which would certainly be something I would support, it barring any surprises. And that's really meant to take some of the accommodation out of the economy and help inflation come back down to a place where people don't have to worry about the price of bacon or the price of used cars. But as you know, that we're not the only part of this puzzle. We also have to get supply chains repaired and we have to get back out of our homes after COVID and start talking about service consumption, not just goods and ser goods consumption. You said you do not favor a half a percent increase in interest rates in March. What do you favor? So I look at the data and I see that it is obvious that we need to pull some of the accommodation out of the economy. But history tells us with Fed policy that abrupt and aggressive action can actually have a destabilizing effect on the very growth and price stability we're trying to achieve. So what I would favor is moving in March and then watching, measuring, being very careful about what we see ahead of us, and then taking the next interest rate increase when it seems the best place to do that. And that could be in the next meeting or it could be a meeting away. But either way, the most important thing is to be measured in our pace and importantly, data dependent. Measured in your pace, the financial markets are anticipating six to seven uh, rate hikes in the year ahead. Is that the kind of tempo you foresee? Well, I think it's too early to call. Really, you want, I mean, you talk about it. We had the, we have Ukraine right now, geopolitical risk. We are just coming out of our homes after Omicron. We hope that the virus will stay at bay, but we have to watch. We have another print before the March meeting on both the employment, the jobs report, and inflation. All of those things are very important before we make any pronouncements about exactly what we'd be doing on this year. I think what every American wants to know and, and deserves to hear is that we're on this and we're gonna take those data in and get the accommodation right-sized for the economy. So, I mean, one of your colleagues out of the Kansas City Fed has, has said current monetary policy is out of sync with the economy. 
Um, the Fed's still injecting some emergency support measures here that, you know, because of the pandemic. Can you continue to do this when inflation is at 7.5%? Is this just about rate hikes? Does well, something more need to happen? That's a terrific question, and, and you're right. We are continuing to taper our asset purchases, but those will be complete by the early March. And markets understand that we're just doing that to ensure that we have a predictable decline in our purchases so we don't dislocate financial markets. If you look at financial markets, they've already priced in the removal of that part of our accommodation, that injection, as you referred to it. And they've also priced in rate increases over the coming year. So I think markets and households and all of my contacts in the business community that I speak to regularly, they understand that the Fed is moving uh, on the policy path and adjusting it so that we get it right-sized for the economy we have. You mentioned geopolitical risk. The Federal Reserve Chair has mentioned the, the crisis in Eastern Europe as a potential risk. How should people at home understand that? I mean, the White House is, is vowing to wage financial war on Russia here. Um, they're cautioning U.S. businesses to be prepared about potential blowback from cyber attacks. How do you foresee this playing out? Well, any time, as you know, that we have geopolitical risk, it creates uncertainty. And Americans are already facing quite a bit of uncertainty, uncertainty about when COVID's ever going to leave our shores, uncertainty about how the economy is going. So this is just another factor. And uncertainty, we know, affects consumer sentiment and ultimately affects consumer demand. So what I think businesses, is, and I know businesses in my district are thinking about, is cautious optimism. They're bullish on our U.S. economy. They're bullish on coming out of the pandemic strong. But they're also very aware that we're not out of... Um, concerns yet. And we have many things in our future that we have to balance. So is that an argument against taking emergency action before March? Is that a prediction that energy prices, you know, how do you see the risk that we're facing right now? So I see risks on both sides. If we act too aggressively, then we could actually add to Americans' uncertainty. Now they have to worry about whether the Fed is being too aggressive. And if we act too slowly, then, of course, we, we have accommodation that's too much for the economy. So that's why this balanced approach, I, we might look at it, I see March is an appropriate time to raise the interest rate. Mm -hmm. And then we have to take in all of the information that you've mentioned and make the right decision at the right time for the economy. Mary Daly, thank you very much for your analysis. Thank you. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.